Hey, Foot Clan, got a great show for you today. We're playing some Dynasty This or That. We'll talk about these playoff matchups over the weekend, my incredible record in my bracket. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Oh, we're staying up here now. <laughs> it's the podcast. Welcome. <laughs> we're a musical now. Tuesday, January 7th, 2020. <laughs> Starring Barbara Walters and Hugh Downs. Baba ba, ba. We well, were all thinking it, and then Jason did it. That's apparently, my entry. Apparently, it's Black Shirt Day today. Did you oh, guys notice this? Well, fantastic. They, they're slimming. <laughs> they're sli- that just tells you exactly what you need to know about the <laughs> dietary choices that have been made in 2020. Because uh, I went to lunch with Mike yesterday. Jason, you've been out of town. Mike and I didn't do any favors to our, se- to our afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> And then we received boxes of Goo Goo Clusters yeah. from one of our uh, Foot Clan supporters, Chris Howell. Shout well, out. Chris. And, um, well, I had to had to remember what those tasted like. And then we turned into Goo Goo Clusters. Oh, and then we wore black shirts and everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. You can't tell. Yeah. Uh, Jason, welcome back into town. Um, you didn't miss anything here on the podcast. That's right. That's right. I but went, uh, you did you did venture to New York and you took children to New York and then that's a that's w- bold and you paid money to do that. We so, paid and we had a blast. Saw some musicals. Went to some museums. Uh, yeah, we heard about the museums. Yeah, we heard Dude, it, your very so hot the, take the, the, about the, not the, liking the greatest museum in the country. The Moors are not museum people. You just walk around and you look. Oh, look at that thing. Look at that on the wall. That doesn't have a button. I like that your <laughs> your approach is over here. Like we're just we're not museum people. I mean that's that's saying very strong things about your family. Yeah, yeah and I'm proud of it. I'm happy. <laughs> we can't read. <laughs> <laughs> now, now in fairness, we we went to the the 9/11 Memorial Museum. That was unbelievable. All right. That was all right. That was moving and 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 beyond interactive in how you go through. So uh, look, museums. Step up your game. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you did tweet about it. Um, we've got a good show today. We've got a, a dynasty edition of this or that, Ooh. which will be very fun to talk about the futures of many fantasy football players today. We'll get into some news. we got buy or sell on the show today. A reminder, a couple things, a couple things. Um, number one. Black shirts are slimming. So if you've yeah. had a rough Christmas, like we, just put on a black shirt. Number two. Our show schedule. Uh, just a reminder: our show comes out from January through June. It's Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday, Thursday. We also have a bonus episode. If you're Ooh, a bonus, if you're a member over at jointhefoot.com, the off-season episodes are a lot of fun, and we there's an extra one that comes out over there. And then we've got the Spitballers podcast. Yes, the comedy podcast comes out on Monday, so you can check that out as well. But, yeah, we're twice a week right now. We're up to three a week in July. Then we're five a week. Regular season schedule from August through December. Oh, let's not talk about that. No, no. Right <laughs> now not, we're – Look, I love it. I love the, the season, but I'm I'm not ready to do it again yet. I need to recharge the batteries. Yeah, yeah. I think we're all we're all trying to do that. But today will be a great episode. You can find us – With goo-goo clusters. That's <laughs> yeah, how that's I recharge. That's how you recharge, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've heard it's a great energy source. They say calories are really energy. <laughs> well, I I believe Mike uh, when we were at lunch and you decided, hey, do you want to get a pazuki? Yeah. Um, you were like, hey, you you hiked yesterday morning, <laughs> and so yeah. I'm just picturing myself, you know, summiting mountains, but like with goo goo clusters in the backpack to just refresh at the top of the mountain. Just melt them down and put them in a camel bag. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the marshmallow's not coming through very well. All right. Um, <laughs> we're, we're moving on. Let's uh, let's get into some buy or sell. Buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. 
All right, we have a buy or sell debate of sorts. I guess we'll see if it's a debate, if we all agree one way or the other. But buy or sell that Miles Sanders mm. will be a top 12 running back in 2020. So Miles Sanders took over the starting role in week 11, finished the season in half point per reception leagues as RB15. He had weeks, week 13, he was the sixth running uh, overall running back, week 15, the third, week 16, the seventh. Um, a strong finish to the year. Won't require offseason surgery for the injuries that he's suffered uh, recently. From week 11 on, when he was the starter, he was the running back seven. So we, we know for sure that he can uh, deliver a top 12 type of performance. The question is, Will he be given that opportunity That's next rough. year? Because this year it took, obviously, a lot of injuries, injuries everywhere for the Eagles. Primarily it was Jordan Howard. That was the first, you know, rung on the ladder. And then all the wide receivers started going down. Well, so D-Jax was the first. Sure, but I'm saying yeah. the, at that the, point in the season, the first thing that propelled Miles Sanders to relevance gotcha, was gotcha. Jordan Howard going down. And then if you look at the, the second half of the year, the amount of targets to the running back position that the Eagles uh, between Boston Scott and Miles Sanders it, it became necessary because they had no wide receiver weapons so th the real question is they've they've clearly seen that they've got something special here if you didn't pay attention the the last part of the year Miles Sanders was excellent right yes. like I, I think people would be surprised if you didn't have Miles Sanders to know he was the running back 15 on the season yeah, he was the 53rd overall pick in last year's draft. We know the talent coming out of Penn State. But the question has been opportunity. I think the line, the top 12 line, that seems like the right number to me. Mm -hmm. Like, that, I'm really on the fence here. I'm buying or selling him as a top 12 running back. I'm going to sell it. I think okay. he will not quite be there next year. I think some of it goes to what Jason is talking about, opportunity, um, presented itself at the end of the year to propel him so high. Um, I think he's going to be right on that razor's edge. But here, here's what I know. Before this season, Doug Peterson believed in the, you know, he acknowledged the reality that injuries happen massively and you need depth. This is why this backfield has always looked comical with Corey Clement, Darren Sproles, Jordan right. Howard, J.J. Uh, you know, they draft Miles Sanders after they sign Jordan Howard. I think Jordan. I think Miles Sanders is an incredible talent, but I believe that Doug Peterson fundamentally believes in great depth, and if you combine the return of wide receivers with great depth, I think he's going to be right on the outside looking in of that top 12, and as a dynasty owner of Miles Sanders, I'd much rather buy it, but I'm going to sell. I Right now, I'm going to buy. He was – we talked about running back 15. He's about 15 points – off of that top 12 area. Alvin Kamara was the running back 12 on the year. But what's interesting is, I mean, how little he actually had the workload at the end of the year where he was really cranking up the numbers. 50 receptions. That's where it's going to come down that's, to. That's awesome. Like, yeah. As, uh, when he was not really the full-time guy until the last quarter of the season. And then on top of that, only three rushing touchdowns. So running back 15, he had – three receiving touchdowns as well, but only three rushing touchdowns, which if he is the primary guy, that easily goes up. I mean, Jordan Howard was a was a rushing touchdown machine to start out the year, so I will buy. I will buy that he could be a, a top 12 guy. I think there it will still be a committee, but I it wouldn't surprise me if that committee heading into the year is it's like it's Sanders and Boston Scott. Yeah, I, I agree with what Andy said earlier. The, this line of saying top 12 is perfect. Yeah. I went and I looked at, okay, top 12 running backs, what does that take? What you know, How many carries do top 12 running backs get? And pretty much across the board, you need 200-plus you need carries. Unless you are uh, Austin Eckler with 132 yeah. Yeah. carries. Get because, done. Because that did go into my head, though, the Austin Eckler line as the template for top 12 for Miles Sanders, the passing game work. Yeah, I just don't – I mean, Austin Eckler was 108 <laughs> targets. That you know, That's that, absurd. That's not happening for Miles Sanders. I'm going to sell here because what I care about is 
the start of the season next year. Now, for dynasty purposes, long term, I think he's a very solid back. He's young. He's talented. I, I like the Eagles' offense. I like Carson Wentz and a healthy crew around him to be a top mm. half offense. So I'm I'm pro Miles Sanders, but I do believe that they will have another back there. I think Boston Scott played his way into a relevant role, a la that Darren Sproles role, and I think it'll be too much of a committee for me to project him as a top 12 back. But the touchdown argument that Mike brings up is a really solid one because Jordan Howard was a, a touchdown machine. Well, and that, and that brings to mind like who they sign matters. Like they're, yes. they're going to, it's not going to be like I don't. I, I'm sure you weren't inferring just those two. Like there's going to be more pieces of the backfield. Miles Sanders in this extended, improved workload over the back half of the year got hurt twice, like two different times. So it just validates this thing that Doug Peterson's reiterated before that it's a, you know, it's a grueling position. You know, his quote: "I believe the National Football League season is a grueling, grinding season, particularly on running backs. And if you don't have a couple of guys you can hang your hat on, it's hard to get through a season." If you bring in a guy that's going to take the goal line, that says a lot. You know that changes the projection to me. Yeah, if they, if they were to say re-sign Jordan Howard now that he had his injury, that his free agent market might not be that hot. Maybe they're able to re-sign him. We've seen him play that touchdown role in this offense. I would expect that to continue. Yeah, it'll be it'll be very interesting going in next year to see what they do at the running back position. They obviously drafted him with high draft stock, so that means a lot. All right, by the way, buy or sell. Buy or sell brought to you by Pristine Auction. If you don't know what Pristine Auction is, it's a sports memorabilia website where you can bid on and get great deals on hundreds of awesome sports memorabilia auctions each and every day. And they've upped their game. Mm. If you go to pristineauction.com, you register with the code BALLERS, they're giving you a $10 credit. That's that's so cool because we, we talk about all the time like, Hey, this uh, we just got this jersey for fifty five dollars over pristine. <laughs> but then it's like it's ten dollars off that. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So you can always and every day the auctions turn over and there are different sports memorabilia and, deals. And every day in this studio, Brooks, our fearless producer, he's always putting new jerseys up on the wall. Kyle Rudolph. Great friend of the show. I didn't even know we had a Kyle Rudolph. Yeah, I, oh, I should have used his intro. You don't get that chance a lot. Hmm. That's playoff, why he's on the wall. Playoff game winner. He had the most um, emphatic, exciting intro. Remember that? Hi, oh. this is Kyle Rudolph, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. That's how he celebrated. That's so After the touchdown, he, you're said, right. he said, I'm Kyle Rudolph. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have scored, scored a <laughs> Football touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh, my god! He actually gosh. was juiced up when they talked to him at, after the game was over. Yeah, they kept asking him if the play was drawn up for him, and he was dodging it like it was a – like, are you going to be back next year question. It was like, just say, yes, it was drawn up for you, Kyle. Like, it's about the team. It's about the team. I'm like, you lined up on a, a five-foot Williams over there. It was drawn up for you. Take credit. All right, uh, you can check that out, pristineauction.com. Let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. <laughs> uh, oh, man. So this weekend they played some playoff football. Oh, man. And uh, incredible games. Buffalo, Houston. Houston won in overtime. Tennessee, New England, the, the dynasty. Mm. Is it over? Tennessee wins the game. I can answer that for you. No. Oh, oh really? Oh, okay. <laughs> the dynasty's not over. Oh, I've, that means it is because whatever you say about the Patriots is the opposite. Well, I did have Tennessee winning this game, so hashtag not true. Okay, fair enough. Um, Minnesota, New Orleans overtime game. Minnesota, Kyle Rudolph on top, twenty six twenty, which was a shocker. Yeah. And then Seattle, Philadelphia. Mike and I were talking about this yesterday. Seattle wins the game seventeen to nine. Carson Wentz goes out after four passes. And yet Seattle hangs on by one score. So I, you know, who knows what happens if Carson Wentz is healthy for this game, um, or what the future holds for Seattle. But I managed, gentlemen, to go. <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. They said it couldn't be done. They said it shouldn't be done. We filled out our brackets last week. We mentioned it on the show. <laughs> I managed to go zero for four this week. 
Well done. I well had, done. I had Buffalo, New England, New Orleans, and Philadelphia winning this weekend. And for those who are like, well, that's that's pathetic. Like going on four is equally as hard <laughs> as going four and zero. Oh. It's an impressive. Feat. It is now to to your defense. Two of these games were overtime games, and then so, Carson got knocked out of the other one right. too. So, I mean, they, these were these were really hard. And uh, Tennessee, New England was fourteen thirteen. I mean, I know that you know that game was narrow. That being said. My bracket's in better shape than both of your guys' brackets. I lost my Super Bowl champion Saints. Yeah, I have. Stupid Will Lutz. Make the field goal going into the half. You be quiet. Skull, baby. Let's go. I have none of these teams that won moving on. So my divisional or my conference championships are intact. But, yeah, that was was impressive. After I went 0 for 2 on the first day, I was telling these guys, I'm like, I can do it, guys. So Saturday. go for 4. Saturday for me was just an, the the range of emotions that I went through on that day were unhealthy, to, to you, say the I've least. Never, I can't believe how into this Buffalo-Houston game Look, you were. You said you were full-on, like, oh, fury-tilting. I have, I, have, I have completely turned on Buffalo. Like, they earned my respect over the course of the season. I was in. I Huge wanted them to in do this well. Game. They were up 16-0. 16-0. And then the team just farted everywhere. Like, they couldn't stop anal leakage happening. Whoa! Whoa because mercy. this was... it. You were up 16 nothing, and then just went full turtle. They kept giving the ball to Frank Gore. That's what you couldn't handle the wasting most. Wasting opportunities. Like I, Frank Gore had one good run. Great. Great. He also had eight runs of, of two or fewer yards, which would... Destroying your team. Destroying. While Singletary looked great. He, he looked fantastic. And uh, then they went into like this prevent defense. I don't know. I turned on the entire team. So I hate it. Like Sean McDermott, I, I hate you again. You are. I hate He you. did turn all the way. I mean, Josh I was, Allen managed to lose 30 yards in two plays. Yeah, oh, which my is goodness. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was poorly coached, poorly handled. I was f- absolutely furious after wanting them to win. I'm telling you, this, this, is, this is why having the home game in the playoffs matters. Right before this game. Well, and also I, having I was like, superpowers of Deshaun Watson where two dude. NFL players hit him at the same time. I've seen that split a man in half. <laughs> but in Deshaun Watson just I, when I was, bounced out of it. it when was I was watching that play, I almost shielded my eyes for what was about to happen to Deshaun Watson. I don't remember a sack that was that hard. A guy full sprint and another guy on the other side sandwich him. And then it wasn't a sack. He, he goes and throws the ball. It I was mean, crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable. But then I got to recover from that because I had I had trolled the Patriot fans with a uh, with Tom Brady's own tweet. If I I don't know if you saw oh, it. Oh, I had seen it. Where where Tom Brady tweeted the, the it was a very inspirational video. The Lion video. We're, we're going to win and I tweeted how embarrassing it will be to lose to Ryan Tannehill and it it caught a little bit of virality, so like people who don't follow me or the show were showing up. The Patriot fans, you know, doing their That's thing. That's the sound of, they make. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna, you're, you're dumb. They're gonna lose. They're gonna win. We're the Patriots, and then they lost. And I got to go back to every single one of their tweets. So Mike had a very petty Saturday. Oh, but it was. That's what I learned. It was unbelievable because everyone who is not a Patriot fan. Who was following that thread? They're with you. They were they were with me till the end. Everyone was having a great time, except for Patriot fans. I'm yeah, you've sorry. had a great time for a while, Patriot fans. Yeah. So let, let's turn this to fantasy for a second, though, because when you think about New England and we got a dynasty, this or that, on the show today. First, tell me whether you think Brady's back, and then second, tell me how you evaluate like, you know, valuable pieces in the Patriots' offense: Edelman, Harry, White. Michelle, you know, how do you think about these players moving forward? I think that's, you know, anytime you go into the off season, you're thinking about the draft, you're thinking about keepers, you're looking at stability. Right now you don't have that because stability just means Brady comes back on an offense that struggled over the back half of the year or he doesn't come back. So how are you even thinking about the Patriots offense for fantasy purposes? Yeah, I mean, I, I believe Tom Brady will be back. He, he doesn't seem like he's going to retire. I think he'll be in the NFL – and he'll almost certainly then be a Patriot. Um, if he's back, though, I mean, you can't trust any of the weapons right now. Brady didn't look special this season. He looked like an older quarterback 
who knows the game well because that's what he is at this point in his career. And Julian Edelman going into next year, if he's back and the wide receiving core is somewhat the same, I'll be in on him to start the year. Whether he'll be able to hold up or not is a completely – a legitimate question, but I don't think you can trust any of the running backs in the running game. It's just too difficult to know what they're going to do. James White, maybe, if you want that somewhat mediocre, somewhat successful week in and week out play. What about Harry? Nikhil Harry started. He started getting more more work as the. I'm not going to be in. <sighs> that stinks. Yeah, I think that that's the the big question mark is Harry and his. Potential. He was a first round pick. He's great. I think he's a, but I just don't know that it's going to. I think Harry's going to be okay. I think Harry's going to be okay because I don't. I don't really trust or believe Edelman's future is very secure. We're already dealing with a player that you know will go down with injury uh, or play through it. You know, he did both of those things this year, each and every year. He was a dominant first half guy. You got to imagine a healthy Julian Edelman and Tom Brady score more than. 13 points against the Titans on the you know at home that that you know or can overcome Miami and never have to play the Titans in this matchup so yeah the Ryans took care of business the, oh gosh yes they <laughs> Brady went down to Fitzpatrick and Tannehill wow Tannehill with his what like 76 passing yards but Harry projects to be the one in that offense for the for some time to come is the way I look at it so it's going to be interesting so when you look at him and you look at DK Metcalf I mean how do you evaluate moving forward right now? Obviously, Metcalf gets the the nod. He's got a stable quarterback, shares the field with Tyler Lockett, low passing volume. I think Harry's going to be okay. Like in a dynasty league today, would you rather have Edelman or would you rather have Harry in a draft? Harry. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, agree. So it'll be interesting to see if Brady comes back and then how we project those players out. A uh, couple other things I wanted to talk about coaching news-wise. Jason Garrett was fired. In the most bizarre fashion of all time, where he was, it was reported he was fired, then he wasn't fired, but they were already interviewing new head coaching. But Garrett had not accepted his firing. He's like, nope, I'm not fired. <laughs> Called it. See, as a Jason, he you're a full squatters, right? You're like a non confrontational dude, right? Yes. And this came across as like a non confrontational situation where eventually they. They like mirrored Garrett's office in one of those like pods, mm -hmm. and then once he got in it, they just drove it away. This is a full <laughs> like they didn't they didn't actually tell him he's fired. He just opened the pod later on, and he was in the middle of a forest. Why am I in New Jersey? Mm -hmm. If he does, maybe New York. Yeah. The, <laughs> if he doesn't get the Giants' job, I fully expect him to show up <laughs> back in back, Dallas. Back in Dallas, just to work, he, free of charge, a full you know stapler uh, situation. Hey guys. So uh, Mike McCarthy's the new head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Cool. Might keep Kellen Moore around, but that wouldn't really be in a play calling capacity if he did, because McCarthy calls the plays, and he's most certainly one is going to want to staple on this team to begin. So we shall see. There was an inter or a, uh, an article going around how McCarthy he got the job because he allegedly has spent the off season. Really, really diving into the new trends of the NFL. Is it Act wrong that I feel like that's like my grandpa going to the iPad classes? Actually, I mean, <laughs> I just don't that's know. That's all he did. He went to the, he went to the genius bar, bar for times. sure. I mean, I just don't <laughs> know how much you can pull off. I make a slideshow. He showed, he's like, have you seen my Apple Watch? <laughs> I'm very, Is that how he got the job? Yep, that's, how he, that's how he got it. I'm very hip with the Hold kids. Hold on, Jerry. Let me take my heart rate. <laughs> One second. I'm hey, sorry. Siri. What play should I call? Mm. <laughs> Mike and I were trying to we were sitting around trying to figure out like there there are many cases where the second go around has worked out for head coaches like Bill Belichick going from Cleveland, you know, Pete Carroll from New York to Seattle. But those have all been in those situations where, you know, short runs in the first place, land in the second place, find a quarterback, get it done. Look, you had a you had a quarterback <laughs> in Green Bay. Oh yeah. You, you had a I good did. one. And you had a really long run, and these double situations where you move on, you know, they have a great team. Like, if I'm Mike McCarthy, this is the one I want. For I mean, sure. I want to go to Dallas, be handed the keys to, you know, elite talent across the board on well, offense maybe. when you're an offensive mind. They got some contractual situations to figure out. Here, here's, They'll find that money. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they will pay everyone. 
and everyone will stay. That genuinely, like I, I think Cooper will be there, Dak will be there, Zeke will be there, Gallup will be ever. ever they're all going to get paid somehow. That's what happens in the NFL. They work their magic and move money around, and then somehow have the money to pay. I, I think Mike McCarthy is going to do well here. Um, I think this is great news for Ezekiel Elliott. This isn't a team, you know, th he's going to use him um, a lot. And even though he's trying to be new school, uh, you know, it, it, he's he's the, I think, the centerpiece of this offense. And um, I, I, I actually think Mike McCarthy is not a bad hire. Like, I, he gets so much blame for the end of the run with the Packers. You're talking about the now 13 and 3 number. Number two seed, Green Bay Packers. But he gets none of the credit for all of the good years with the Packers, right? It's It was all Aaron Rodgers is why they were good, and it's all Mike McCarthy why they were bad, but that just doesn't seem fair. It's probably not. Yeah, it's probably not but fair. But it's I mean, fun. McCarthy, <laughs> It's true. He, he could stabilize things for a while, but I feel like that's literally Jason Garrett's best feature is stabilization. You yeah. Know, I – I, we'll see how it goes. I think the hardest thing for fantasy purposes is here you are for like a third time evaluating Zeke's passing game chops and what's going to happen, right? Like, you know, we got a new offensive coordinator this past year and you didn't see those type of top end performances from Zeke on the basis of high target, high passing game volume like you had the year before. And now you've got a new head coach coming in. It's not like you're not drafting Zeke, but it's still something to, to be said about you know, does he belong at number two behind Christian McCaffrey? And, right. And that'll depend on his passing game involvement to me. Well, I still think one of, if not our most important show every offseason is the coaching changes episode. Because right now, you know, look, I have not spent the last month researching Mike McCarthy's history again and reminding me of his play calling and all of that. But by the time we come around to the head coaching changes, we will have deep dived all of these coaches, their tendencies, and be able to project, I, I think, uh, you know, pretty, yeah. pretty accurately the way forward for these teams. His targets went from 95 down to 71. Uh, there is actually, if you had spent more time in the uh, Museum of Natural History, Jason, there is a McCarthy exhibit back towards the mm. the back. So you could have maybe done a deep dive while you were there. I was inside for a solid 18 minutes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're not Peace. Gonna get, gonna get, I'm out of here. Peace, museums. <laughs> I don't see any buttons. Yeah. All right. Mike Rule. Or I'm sorry, Matt Rule. Head coach uh, of ja. the... <laughs> I believe it's... Ja, ja, ja <laughs> the new head coach of the Panthers. Where would I be with them, my this baby? just broke. I mean, this morning. We're recording this Tuesday morning. Um, all like signs pointed towards Rule being the primary target of the New York Giants, and all of a sudden the Panthers just hire him. Oh, and then it was murder. Oh, gosh. I'm here for all John Rule. Yeah, I know you this are. This is your fault, dude. This is, I, this is fault. my credit. <laughs> I get credit for this. Um, but now the Giants apparently will consider Jason Garrett. <laughs> they they have had a, a apparently a They want to go revenge mode? A, I, I think they've got a long history of believing in him as a, as a coach and him being on one of their uh, short lists. So yes. it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But, I mean, really, would, would Jason Garrett be – I, I feel like you, you just brought it up, right? What's his strength? It's like sta a stabilizing force, right? I feel like that's 15 year what, commitments available. That's what the Giants need. They need a stable, you know what I mean? Like, I, I wasn't, you know, all about them bringing in a college coach. They, 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 they just need, they need mediocrity right now. They need an eight and eight season. Like, this is where, that's the way up. Doug Peterson's going to keep winning this division. Yes. Because you've got the stabilizers all around. Gar if it's Garrett, McCarthy and and Rivera, Jason Garrett. Like those are not is like to your coach position. It he's prevent defense to like, your coach yes position. Uh, you're you're trying to not lose. Go try to win the game. I don't know. They might settle for not losing in New York. <laughs> That's so, what I'm saying. They, yeah, yeah. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I don't know how much I buy into the fact he's going to swoop right back into oh, that division. Garrett and Gettleman. But it would be oh, give it to me. <laughs> I might. need it. We can root for a couple things here on the show. We can root for fantasy success. Um, we can root for a comedic value. Yes. And uh, I think that's the one uh, we're going for in New York. So. Garrett and Gase hanging out in New York. Oh, my God. That is, that is a true yin and yang. Because Garrett is 
<laughs> say, what, say what you will. Yeah. Garrett is a super nice guy. Like right. very, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a people person that everybody who knows him loves him. And Gase is something else. Something <laughs> that he's the Yang to the Yin. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're doing a this or that. Is that, is that rule? Dynasty edition. I almost made that joke, Mike, but I didn't <laughs> want to bring it back up. Murder. <laughs> All right. Um, so what we're doing here, we're doing this or that. These are players that are back-to-back -back in early off-season dynasty startup average draft position. That was a mouthful. So these are guys that are very closely ranked right now in dyna dynasty startup leagues. This or that, who would you rather have in a dynasty edition? Joe Mixon, Cincinnati Bengals running back, or Jacksonville's Leonard Fournette, Ooh. okay? Joe Mixon is, uh, he's got him, he's a year younger. We saw Fournette as one of the most consistent producers in fantasy over the last, or over the whole season. But over the back half of the year, Joe Mixon was just incredible from week, you know, eight on, really. So, dynasty wise, who would you rather have? Dynasty wise, <clears throat> I feel like Leonard Fournette is 24 going on 38. I don't know if either of you two feel like this, but he doesn't. Str I mean, 24 is, is a great age for, you know, a, a dynasty asset. That right. is a young. As opposed to like year 37 going on 38. Exactly. Okay. And and you know, I feel like Leonard Fournette just seems like he has so many more miles and wear and tear on the body. You know, he's a workhorse in college, has been a workhorse in the NFL, has dealt with injury at every single level. I think that that's what makes you feel that way. I don't think you feel that way if he hasn't gone through the injury bumps and bruises before this past season, which he did hold up for the most part. So but, I mean, that's why I feel that way. I feel I'm, like he's just been a I'm grinder. Confident. I'm very confident that by the time that Leonard Fournette retires, he, his beard will be full gray. It will be a full <laughs> All right. Well, gray. on that basis, then, in a dynasty league, he's around a while, right? I mean. No, that's two years from now. So, <laughs> full, so full for what gray. it's worth, Leonard Fournette has fewer NFL carries than Joe Mixon does. Leonard Fournette has 666 wow. career carries. Joe Mixon has 693. So, it's perception's not reality there. From an actual workload standpoint, he is one year older, and I'd rather have Joe Mixon. I mean that Joe Mixon showed the top side on a bad team. He was the RB four over the last eight games, and to me, you know, you between film, age, and that type of top end upside on a horrible team, like Joe Mixon is the guy for me. Like I think Mixon's one a great dynasty for upset. me. It they're both in a contract year of twenty twenty. I can't recall uh, exactly what happened to Fournette's contract because a, a bunch of weird things happened where yeah they could his, just let his, him go. His guaranteed money was was cut, but I mean he was a first round pick, so he should have that fifth year option. Uh, I so I think the fifth year option is still is he, there, so it wouldn't technically be a contract year for Fournette. But like to me, it's who's more likely to get a second year or, or get that that next contract of substantial value. And it, I think it's Joe Mixon at this point. So he's the guy I would rather have. Yeah, I, I think both players will get another contract, whether it's with their same team or elsewhere. They're talented runners, but I, I'm, I'm, you know, in uh, agreement with you two. Joe Mixon is a player I'd rather have. He is a year younger, and if you look at their two opportunities, and you say, okay, which team? The Bengals were so bad this year, and I think that they have you know, the ability to get better as a team, whereas Jacksonville, the wheels are falling off, and it seems like they're going to want and maybe need some changes. Man, 100 targets. That's so, the thing that's so crazy. He had targets. more than twice as many targets as Joe Mixon over the course of the year. That's wild. Um, and that is what I think is going to end up changing. Uh, Leonard Fournette is not a specialist as a receiving back. You, you can see that when you watch the games. And that's not to say he... I mean, he clearly got th that role on lockdown this year. But the other running backs that were there, I mean, this is why going into the season, this was like the best argument for Leonard Fournette right. this last year, is that it was 
only his show. They got rid of TJ Yeldon and didn't really replace him. So everything was Leonard Fournette's. Well, going into next year, I think they're I, I don't I don't think it will only be Leonard Fournette. I think they're gonna say we need a little bit more depth here and bring someone else in. Whereas you know, you had Giovanni Bernard, you know, back there with with Joe Mixon. So if Leonard Didn't Fournette Gio get an extension, uh, I I don't remember. I know there were talks, but uh, if if you have Leonard Fournette losing, yeah, Gio's there for a couple years, still. a chunk of the receiving work. Then I think next year, just next year, while well, these you know not the future, I think Joe Mixon will have a better year than Leonard Fournette, and then you've got a guy who's younger. So I, I'm on the Joe Mixon side. All right. Um, are you on the Mixon side too? Then yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Cortland Sutton or Stephon Diggs? Dynasty this or oh, that? Man. Cortland Sutton or Stephon Diggs? Um, you know, Diggs has had the obviously more productive career thus far. Sutton is younger, and you know, it was just in his second season. It seems like Drew Locke is going to be the quarterback in Denver for the time being. We know Kirk Cousins is the quarterback in Minnesota. We know Stephon Diggs has. I think garnered eye rolls from at least Mike and I. Yeah, with his behavior yeah. when the team is the, you're, you know, win, the, you're winning a playoff game, and you're mad you're not getting targets. Yeah, and they were four and two. I, I think when he was I whining about his targets in the regular season. I want, I would want targets too, but you're winning a playoff game, man. That's that's a tough situation to be complaining in. So where do you weigh in here? Last year Sutton was seventy two for. Um, 1,112 yards, six touchdowns on 125 targets. Diggs, Diggs was 63 for 1130 and six. Very similar stat lines. From a dynasty perspective, I am definitely on the Cortland Sutton side. Okay. Um, I think that he is the clear one for his team, whereas Diggs, you know, if Adam Thielen is around, is who's the one? Is it Thielen? Is it Diggs? There's always that debate, but he is not the clear number one. Obviously, he's got a better quarterback situation with Kirk Cousins, but – with Cortland Sutton, you saw him this year through a myriad of quarterbacks outperform Stephon Diggs this season, and that was in his sophomore year. He's two years younger. He was drafted to be a star, and we saw plenty of flashes of that. I'm taking my shot at having that number one beast wide receiver. I don't think you're ever going to get that from Stephon Diggs. And, and Diggs, historically, has been very difficult for fantasy. You know, you bring up Amari Cooper as one of these guys yeah, that hurts you fair. a lot. Diggs is not a guy whose consistency helps in fantasy. He he wins you a couple weeks, but he's also he, he does a great job of just disappearing. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't have wanted him this past year, and I know we'll talk about truth the truth episodes coming up next week, and we'll talk about wide receivers. But I'd much have rather preferred Sutton, you know, this past year. I think. <laughs> Yeah, he did. Stephon Diggs, Amari Cooper is a great comp to bring up. He's just where it's, it's maddening because Stephon Diggs, his ability to create separation is elite in the NFL. But then you're like, <clears throat> here's the first three games for Stephon Diggs, wide receiver 70, 43, 83. And I mean, like that part of that is the was the play calling of Minnesota at the beginning of the year, but it's... Well, even that, when it got like turned, that's that's it, all built into Stephon Diggs. Even when that got turned around, and you know, starting week six, he was the wide receiver one, six, and yeah. fifteen. You're like, oh, okay, he's back. It's back. He's a guaranteed mainstay in my lineup. The next couple weeks, wide receiver eighty one and forty four. He's just always been very inconsistent as as a you know as a week in and week out starter. So I'm going to take the shot at the at the. I think the what upside Sutton could become the upside of Sutton is much higher than the upside of Diggs. Although Sutton's floor could still be, you know, this could have been a, a one year wonder. I don't believe that, but that is within the range of possible outcomes for Sutton. They're both so young, so it's like if you if you drop Stephon Diggs into a high target situation, I think he could, you know, he's the kind of player that can lead the league in receptions. He could lead the league in in yards. Like that's why it's maddening. Yeah, it, that's it's, the it's all there, but. Part. But I mean, in, in Stephon Diggs is he'll be a Viking, yeah, for the foreseeable future. All right, this or that tight ends: Hunter Henry or Darren Waller. Oh man! I am the walrus. Goo -goo -goo -goo. So um, it just reminds me of Goo Goo Clusters. Uh, Should we uh, take a break? Yeah, let's take a break. <laughs> Can we take a little? Honestly, if two of you talk, uh, two of us talk, the other can eat the goo goo cluster. You guys, hashtag carry on. 
Not a sponsor, by the way. Just yet delicious. Goo goo. Yeah, come reach, on, man. Reach out. You don't think we want a goo goo themed segment on this show? Yeah, where we just talk about Dan Waller. <laughs> goo 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 clusters. <laughs> We're willing to make the t- <laughs> no. Uh, listen, Waller is twenty seven. Henry is twenty five, but has a bit of the Leonard Fournette, you <laughs> yeah. know, oh, feeling yeah. about him. I don't worry about either of the ages because w- when it comes to tight ends, a good quality tight end, he could play into his mid thirties just fine. So twenty seven, he's two years older than Hunter Henry, but I, I don't think the age should be the deal breaker here. I'm I'm Walrus here. I'm Whoa. going I'm going Darren All Waller right. it, pretty firmly because when I'm looking at tight end and predictability and the the onslaught that we have every year of you know not knowing who's going to be there, be stable. Look, is is Darren Waller going to be what he was through the first three weeks of the season every week? I don't think that's the future. But here's what I know. He got paid money. He's hyper-athletic and involved in the passing game. And his head coach is going to be there for a while. That's true. And knows how to use him. And he's he's a huge fan of him. So do I know Anthony Lynn's going to be the Chargers coach? I would almost bet money he won't be after next year. Is Hunter Henry going to be a Charger next year? Exactly. And then, you know, even the Rivers situation. Maybe he is a Charger, but Rivers turns over. And, yes, Derek Carr could go goodbye right now, too. But I see a little bit more stability on what I've seen from Waller. He was healthy for the duration of the season. We had another season of Hunter Henry being hurt to begin it after missing a season. Uh, I'm, you know, and then Waller puts up 90 receptions. I'm, I'm in on Waller's. Yeah, I, this was a pretty easy Hunter Henry for me at first because he, he's been, you know, more productive career-wise, per game-wise, um, you have the issues with Darren Waller of he was really successful for fantasy when he was the guy. But as soon as any other wide receiver emerged, you, you know, uh, then all of a sudden his targets evaporated. And I think they're going to bring someone else in. But you make a really good point, Andy, in that, you know, Gruden wants an offense. He said this. His offense runs through the tight end position. And you see that because it's not just the Wallerist. Yeah, you have uh, Justin you, Moreau. Yeah, um, you know, and so I do like the the known commodity of Waller going forward. I think the ceiling is higher on Henry, and I would I I I think I would lean Henry here because wherever he is, he's going to be paid to be a passing weapon. Um, but it's it's close, and there's less risk with Waller. Other than you do have to factor in the risk of you know he's been a repeat offender before for uh substance abuse and and we've you know you have to factor that in when looking at the dynasty outlooks of if something happens again right. it's going to be a long term suspension yeah I, I i like waller henry thus far in his four year nfl career he's played in 64 percent of possible games um it's close mike do you do you cite on the age? I, you know, you get a couple age, years with Henry. The age and the ceiling, like the the things that Hunter Henry. Do you really think his ceiling is higher than Waller's? I do. I so uh, so give me that season then, because I mean, obviously Waller went out. Waller went out and put up last year ninety for over eleven hundred. Right. And three, if anything, I would say Waller underwhelmed touchdown wise for a big guy that could go up in that department. He he certainly three did three touchdowns, but I don't. Uh, it just doesn't seem like that high-end touchdown season is, is in the range of outcomes to me for Darren Waller. Like, he's a PPR guy. Uh, and, and shockingly, like when I would watch him, he doesn't play big. And for a guy who's as fast as he is, he gets caught. But do you really want – don't you want the PPR now nowadays in the tight end position where, you know, if Henry doesn't get into the end zone – he had a couple weeks at the end of the year that we projected great games for right. him. He ends up outside the top 40 because he doesn't get in the end zone, where Waller, he never had a week all year out outside the, what, 22. Yeah. I, I, and we I, te- I'm just saying philosophically, I sure. wonder what I'm looking at anymore. Am I just looking to get the Gronky in? Like, Henry's more like what Gronk would be, right? The and potential of a 10, 11, 12 touchdowns. The Hunter Henry – Next year could have double digit touchdowns. I think he's had horrifically bad luck with his health. That's that is a big red flag because I mean it's it's been many many years now of of Hunter Henry's body just seems like it it doesn't want to play in the NFL. But when he has been on the field, he has been electric, doing things that 
very few tight ends have ever done at that age. So I'll still go in on hearing Hunter. hearing all these different sides of these two players. I I think Andy has swayed me. I think I am on the Darren Waller side. I think the consistency with targets fundamentally right now, if you're in any kind of half point or full point PPR league, I think is what I'm looking for at my tight end position. I just want it to be safer, be just safe, plug it. You know, it's like, it's a stop gap and then put all of my great resources into, I'm, which is wild. Cause I bet you, if you have Hunter Henry right now, I bet you could go flip him for Darren Waller plus great. Really? I think you could. In a, in a, dynasty, in a, in a dynasty league. Sell yeah. the sell the youth. Yeah. If 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 you are on the Darren Waller side, I think you can make get that happening. It's interesting. Waller was kind of uh I think scaring people towards the end and then ended on a pretty strong note. It'd be it'd be tough. I wouldn't trade him. But all right. Dynasty this or that, Baker Mayfield. Or Jared Goff. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Baker Mayfield or Jared Goff. I don't think you even think about the age side of things here. It doesn't really matter. They're both, uh, what, they're about a year apart. But young quarterbacks, we've seen the ups and downs. I don't know how I wouldn't take Jared Goff. Yeah, this is an easy <laughs> Goff for me. I mean, I I, the, I think the, the, the rationale for taking Baker here is, again, based on the upside. The what could be, you know, if he's got a healthy Odell Beckham and they figure it out, you know, maybe it was a coaching problem. We saw, I mean, there was a reason why coming into this season, Baker was either the fourth or fifth quarterback taken off the board. Oh, my. It was insane. Oh my. But those reasons. <laughs> Regrets for some of you out yeah, there. Those reasons, I think, still are there for some people. And you hope that he turns it around, becomes the, the next stage of the rookie Baker that we saw. But. Jared Goff's already been a really good quarterback. He's got a monster contract. He's with Sean McVay. I, I'm definitely on the Jared Goff side here. <sighs> Man. Remember how terrified we were to make Baker Mayfield yeah, a bust, a bust yeah. in the UDK? Like, I remember literally sitting around going like, okay, yes, we believe this. But is this worth putting down on paper? Right. Like, because what if it goes the like? Is it worth it to us? Yeah. Well, and he was the is first. Is the one. risk worth it? You know, the quarterbacks are at the top. You go to you go to the bus page, and the first thing is Baker Mayfield bus, and it was like, ooh, that feels bad. Like, Everyone is it loves worth them. the risk? <laughs> it worked. So, what do you think, Mike? Because it is a bit of a seen versus unseen, right? We, I think we understand what the Jared Goff experience is in the NFL, and it can be really great. But generally, we look at Goff as a situational start. Do you think Baker can get to the point where he is an every week type of start because of weapons or you know who comes into Cleveland? Yeah, man. I wish I wish we knew who that coach was going to be because that it, like, a great head coach hired Freddie <laughs> Mercury. Mercury, no. <laughs> yeah, kitchens. Like because if a great offensive mind goes into Cleveland, I will try not to overreact, but I'll be very excited again for Baker Mayfield. What good Baker is better than good Jared Goff to me. Hmm. I don't know that Baker can get to the point where he is consistent and stable the entire time. And like, I feel like we've now. Look, if seen, ifs and buts were candy and nuts, the sure. Browns would be in the playoffs, Mike. Yeah, you no, know, I totally get that. But we've seen peak Jared Goff. That that I feel pretty confident in. I've we've seen the high end of Jared Goff now. He Jared Goff is never going to be that top five guy on a weekly basis. Sure. I agree with that. He will not be top five on a weekly basis. And they both can put up numbers against bad defenses. So similar to the Stephon Diggs. Cortland Sutton thing I'm I hate all I hate my all of my answers just being oh, I'm going to chase the upside here of dynasty because I say it's almost revealing it's not smart it's revealing some of our strategic mm. differences though isn't it yeah it I'm is. I back to back dynasty champ over here hey you're a former dynasty champ right right before you oh right before me and then I took the last two now Mike you were in the championship a couple times right I was yes <laughs> Did you win either of those? No, I did not. But you are the most proud a person can be of back-to-back -back silver medals. Like, you almost... That's right. He was... Mike... <laughs> like, yeah. if you were in there a third straight championship game, would you have wanted the silver for oh, the... Of course. Well, uh, I can... Look, yes. You gotta take second place, because it's great. A little insight. First the worst. 
Uh, Mike was constantly, as soon as I, I got in the championship, he was calling us both. We're both in the two metal club, <laughs> which is like, because you have two silvers. <laughs> was uh, I correct? You are not correct. They We're don't in- make silver. Sorry. Nobody prints yeah. those. <laughs> We're not going to fantasychamps.com to get you. Just fill it up with second place. You memorabilia. tell that to the Olympians. Who well, got okay. silver medals. Because that's, that's basically what I am. <laughs> An Olympian. <laughs> yes, you are a fantasy Olympian. I am going to officially vote Goff here, uh, Jason. Yes, Goff. I'm going to take Baker. Okay. All right. Let's take a couple minutes for some mailbag before we close things out. Mailbag. Mailbag. Yeah. Gold, All right. gold medal mailbag. Man. Oh, man. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Feeling so good about your silvers. <laughs> if you have a question for the podcast, great time to submit them. Go to the website, click the submit a question button, or you can dial our voicemail hotline 302-464-TFFB. And here's what's great. The Thursday episode, we've got an AMA, a Fantasy Footballers AMA this time of year. Perfect for it. Ask us any and all questions that you got. We'll talk about them on the show. I think it was a huge hit last year, Brooks. Yes, sir. Yeah. There you go. Uh, it was, we got it from the horse's mouth. It <laughs> indeed was, <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. All right. This question comes from Twitter. Where should Devontae Parker be drafted if Fitzmagic, Fitzmagic isn't the quarterback to start the season? Um, if That's didn't... like saying, I mean, I can't answer that if I don't know who his quarterback is, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, well, he, here's the deal. If it's not Fitz Magic, then I think we can at least, with some semblance of confidence, say then it's a rookie, because yes, they're not going to go in and get some other vet to come. Josh Rosen isn't even going to be part of that team. They're either going to draft a guy who ends up playing his way in week one, or Fitz Magic, I believe, will be that guy. So. If Fitz is the guy, he's a top 10 for me. Yes, but this question is, let's say he's not. So you've got a rookie in there. That makes a huge impact. Wide receiver, low end two. Yeah, I was going to say like 24, which yeah, is yeah. the lowest end two you Look, can if be. Miami, listen up. Draft two at five. Sit him and play Fitz for one more year. Trust the process. Get to a healthy. Get him a year of experience on an NFL bench slash practice field. Let Fitz magic run the show again, all the Devontae Parker owners, sing and dance in the streets for a year, and then bring Tua in yes. next season. That's what I think the script should be, and I think it, I think there's a pretty high probability it will be that. Yep, I agree. All right. Um, Zach in Virginia. This year we witnessed Derrick Henry and Devontae Parker finally live up to the hype. With more coaches willing to build their offensive schemes around specific talents of their players, is there anybody currently languishing in mediocrity mm. that you could see emerging as an elite talent next season? Uh, I think I think you saw all of that play out with Joe Mixon during the year. So languishing first half, build around second half. So I guess he's kind of done that. But I think that he's a good example of a team adjusting, making him the focus. Um, you guys have anybody top of mind here when you think of languishing? I mean, the languishing part is what makes it hard. Like you've got the Devin Singletary's Debo Samuels, the guys that they, they weren't really languishing, but they, they have not officially broken out yet because they didn't have a prolonged starting role for the season. But those are the first two guys that come to mind of could really take that leap. Robbie Anderson. Sure, that's a good one. But that would be because he's escaping the clutches of Adam Gase and the New York Jets. I mean, I expect you think he can go somewhere and have an offense built around him, though. I think he can. Oh man, I do not. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't look at him. I don't think he's going to make more money than he'll probably make less than what Tyrell got on the open market. Tyrell last year. made a he had a pretty decent contract, though. Yeah, but don't, I mean, did you think that the Raiders were going to build around Tyrell? No, because they also traded for Antonio Brown. Yeah, I look. I don't want to take anything good, away from. That's a good comeback. They <laughs> traded you. for him, but then did Brown play for them? No. Did they build their offense around Tyrell Williams? Did he I, show I himself capable? I didn't think of it? it would. I didn't think it would shift to that. Yeah. He, he doesn't all of a sudden become that guy. Generally, free agent wide receivers of that tier, you certainly don't bring them in to be your your one and. I, build I get it. Free agency for wide receivers, it's it's a more miss 
than it is. A, yeah. <laughs> it's more of a missed proposition. Yes. Uh, so when you look at um, running backs in that boat, somebody that has been sitting back, playing second fiddle, being part of a team, is it the uh, the Melvin Gordon sharing time? Is it the Eckler situation? You know, is Kareem Hunt languishing? Yeah, Kareem, Kareem Hunt Kenyon would be Drake. The, I think Hunt gets a starting job. Yeah, Kareem Hunt would be the guy that I think has been languishing, playing the second fiddle since uh, his incident. And he will he has the opportunity to go out and have an offense uh, built more around him in the running game. I, I, you know, it's, it's really hard for a running back to be a backup and then come into, you know, unless they were a rookie, and then come into relevance – running backs tend to break out really young in their career. The reason that Derrick Henry was able to do it is not because, uh, you know, it, it, it was it was 100% because he was behind a star running back. They drafted him surprisingly when they had DeMarco Murray, the Titans did, and DeMarco Murray was great. So it wasn't like Derrick Henry himself was poor. He just, you know, was – so you'd have to look at a team that has a star running back right now I mean, I guess maybe that's the Austin Eckler, right? The, there's not many Melbourne. of them. I mean, when you look at the situations, there's nobody that you're sitting there where we've said, you know, Henry was that guy. That, this is the year for Henry. No, it's not. This is the year for Henry. No, it's not. I mean, there's nobody out there in, you know, maybe the, we're not I would have remembering said, them right now. But I would have said Rashad Penny. I would have loved to say that. Maybe or Aaron Jones last year was that guy, right? Yeah. Yes, he was. So, yeah, I don't. I, th those are the names that come to mind. Um all right, let's do one more here from Twitter. Jace, what, what's the best number of people to start a Dynasty League? As in owners? Yeah, the best number, if, if that's what this question is, which is how I interpret it, um, the best number is 10 or 12 committed owners. Like 12 would be the best, but I would so much rather, you can't, it's, it's harder to change ownership. You want to keep Dynasty owners around for a long time. And if you've got 12 really close you know, men and women that want to play this and they're committed. And then you've got a couple others that are like, they might be in then I, but they're not sure. Right. I would rather play with the 10, but 12 Especially is actually in a dynasty. Yeah. But 12 is the best number because you, you could make the argument that if you start with 10, you're going to stay with 10 because expanding in a normal league ownership is easy. Expanding in a dynasty, difficult, very difficult. So 12 is the best number. Because I think that's the context in which all the shows that you're listening to are talking about, you know, a running back one being a top 12 guy, running back two being a top 24 guy. That's that's the context that most fantasy advice is given. So 12 is the best, but if you can't get 12 great owners, then uh, then 10. But you can get 12 great owners on, at footclanleagues.com. Right, it helps. It certainly does. Hey, Judge Giamatti, um, how do our listeners involve themselves in this Thursday AMA? Um, we're going to be posting on all socials asking for questions, and you can always submit questions on the website as well. Okay, so you'll be parsing all of those things? You, oh, yeah. You and Al will be looking through? To, yeah, today. Okay, so Twitter at the FF Ballers. You can um, get in contact with us, with us there. Instagram.com slash Fantasy Footballers, Thursday AMA show. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. I that did. is it for us. Check out, uh, I think we still have a Foot Clan giveaway over at footclangiveaway.com. Who can, knows? You can check out as well. I think it's Sammy Watkins. Oh, see you Thursday. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.